Akfar key questions. Question number one. Um, the cell are placed in an apparatus with a solution of sugar, a majority of nutrients of yeast metabolism. The apparatus detects bubbles of gas released by the yeast cells. The rate of respiration varies with the surrounding temperature as indicated by the data below. We have temperature degrees Celsius, number of bubbles produced per minute. Uh, temperature 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, number of bubbles. Notice number of bubbles have an optimum around just 12, around 30 degrees Celsius. Graph the results on the axes provided. Determine the optimum temperature for respiration in the yeast. Number one, X and Y. On the X axis, we will have the temperature, degrees Celsius. Make sure that the lines are spaced out, like 10, 20, spaced out evenly. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. On the Y axis, we have number of bubbles. Okay, the, indep the independent variable is the temperature on the X axis and the dependent on the Y axis. Uh, the optimum, uh, the optimum is 30 degrees Celsius because the 12, the highest number of bubbles, the 12, which is at 30 degrees Celsius. Respiration is a series of an enzyme catalyzed action using your knowledge of enzyme and the data above analyze and explain the result of the experiment. We should say uh, that enzymes work um, as the temperature increases up to 30 degrees Celsius, which is the optimum, we have the um, highest rate. Below 30 degrees Celsius, um, with a lower temperature, we had uh, lower kinetic energy for molecules, which means lower uh, respiration rate. But higher than 30, the temperature is higher, meaning the enzyme will be denatured, denatured. And uh, that's it. Design uh, an experiment to test the effect of varying the pH of sugar solution on the rate of respiration, including prediction of the expected results. It's clear that enzymes also affected by pH. The uh, best pH for enzyme, majority of enzymes around seven. We have few exceptions like pepsin, but when you know majority of enzymes uh, work best around pH of seven. So they expected, of course, once again, you're gonna have uh, the pH on the X axis and the Y axis, you're gonna have the rate of respiration. Uh, before seven, you're gonna have lower rate. At seven, you have an optimum, you know, uh after uh, at seven after seven you're also going to go down again because the ph is going to be basic the unit of genetic organization in all living organism is the chromosomes describe the structure and function of the parts of a eukaryotic chromosome you may wish to include the diagram as part of your description okay that's an easy question you could say that the chromosomes are um kept in the nucleus, inside the nucleus, when it comes to eukaryotic cells. Um, you can say that <clears throat> chromosomes are made out of DNA. Um, DNA is wrapped around a special protein called histones, you know, uh, wrapped around histones tightly to, because, uh, to, have, uh, to fit uh, so much information in a smaller, uh, tighter space, okay? And that's it. Describe the adaptive evolutionary significance of organizing genes into chromosomes. This is a tough one. Most students don't answer this question. Three points they want you to talk about. Point number one is the ability for the adaptive evolution, evolutionary to be uh, a genetic variation. You know, yes, when chromosomes are inside the nucleus, now uh, they have uh, the ability to do uh, crossing over. With the crossing over, we increase genetic variation, you know, which is number one. 
uh, when they are close to each other, they have uh, independent assortment. You know, when, you know, so number one is genetic variation. Uh, number two, under adaptive evolutionary, we could say organization. Organization, yeah, because they are, you know, uh, tightly wrapped inside the nucleus, they are um, organized, they are highly organized. This way we can make sure, ensure that all cells, when they divide, they have the same number of chromosomes. You know why? Because they're all located in the same area. But if chromosome otherwise would be in a different part of the cells, we might miss this one, we might miss that one. But because they are all tightly packed in the nucleus, it will be easy to do that higher level of organization. Number three is um, complexity. Complexity, we can add methyl group or as you know, methylation, you know, we can add uh, poly A, we can add <clears throat> guanine, all this due to the fact because chromosomes are tightly packed in the nucleus, and that's it. How does the function and uh, structure of the chromosome differ in prokaryotes? Um, function, chromosomes in prokaryotes and, and eukaryotes are uh, <clears throat> linear, however, chromosomes in prokaryotes are circular, uh, chromosomes in uh, eukaryotes are um, wrapped around uh, histones. They are tiny, highly coiled, 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 but uh, no coiling in the chromosomes when it comes to uh, prokaryotes. Chromosomes in, eu in eukaryotic cells, they uh, carry so much information and highly complex. You know, the nucleoid in the uh, prokaryotes are not as sophisticated that's good enough angiosperms flowering plants have wide distribution in the biosphere and the largest number of species in the plant kingdom discuss the function of four structures for reproduction found the angiosperms and the adaptive evolution is significant to reach number one that i I'd like to start with the, the endosperms endosperms because we have double fertilization in them angiosperms and double fertilization is exclusively in angiosperms only so we have double fertilization which means the second fertilization which forms the endosperm is that food source for their seed okay that's number one number two uh, angiosperms they have heterospores you know they have uh, spores that they are small uh, gametophyte uh, and we have uh, megaspores, number two. Number three, um, the uh, pistil and carpel, the male part and female part, are organized uh, next to each other in a flower, in a structure we call flower. What else? What else? Um, angiosperms, uh, you know, um, you know um, the ovary, which is the fruit, okay, the ovary, which is the fruit, you know, the seeds organize inside the ovary, okay? The ovules, which is the seeds are the ovules. If you have an apple, the, the, the seeds are the ovules and the actual fruit is the ovaries. So the ovules are protected in the ovaries. Mosses, bryophytes have not achieved uh, the widespread uh, Terrestrial success of angiosperms discuss how the anatomy and reproductive strategies of mosses limit uh, their distribution. Mosses are lower plants. They are most primitive. They don't have xylem. They don't have phloem. Because of that, they cannot grow high. Because if you don't have xylem, you cannot grow tall. You know, because you don't have xylem, they uh, cannot live in hot areas because they depend on moist environment. So they have to live in moist environment. Uh, they can limit their um, uh, metabolism by the uh, water availability. That's good enough. That's enough. Uh, explain alternation of generation in either angiosperms or mosses. I'm going to pick uh, mosses, you know, alternation of generation in plants. Mosses have alternation of generation just like all other plants. And um, in the diploid phase, they are sporophytes. And in the haploid, they are gametophytes. They alternate between, you know, uh, gametophyte and sporophyte. And the dominant, dominant phase 
and the mass is uh, is the uh, gametophyte. Okay, that's enough. An important defense against uh, disease in vertebrate animals is the ability to eliminate, inactivate, or destroy foreign substances and organisms. Explain how the immune system achieves three of the following. Provide an immediate uh, non-specific immune response. Non-specific, which means everything below the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes are the T and B, T cells and B cells. So macrophage, you know, non-specific. Macrophage eat pathogens, you know, through uh, phagy or uh, the eating. They surround, you know, they form pseudopods and eat, you know, bacteria. And number two, uh, histamine. Histamine is a chemical substance you uh, released by body, my body or your body when you are when you have infection. They do vasodilation. Vasodilation to allow you know vaso means you know uh, blood vessels will dilate. That will allow white blood cells to exit from blood vessels outside into interstitial fluid to fight infection in the interstitial fluid. That's another one. A third one. Um, you know, we can talk about interferons. Interferons are a special protein uh, made to uh, make holes in the cell wall of bacteria and so much more. Um, activate T and B cells in response to an infection. Activation of T and B. Oh, number one, you have to know that T cells, under T we have uh, T helper cells. And we have T cytotoxic. Both of them, you know, under T, T cells, they fight uh, cell mediated. What do, we, what do we mean by cell mediated? It's they fight hand in hand combat, you know, kickboxing, taekwondo, uh, uh, boxing, whatever, you know, hand in hand combat fight. However, when it comes to B cells, B cells, they manufacture antibodies, you know, they go to their own labs. They manufacture antibodies specifically towards the specific pathogens. So how do we activate the T cells? You know, a macrophage, when they um, eat uh, pathogens, they take part of their uh, antigens and they form APC, antigen-presenting cells. With antigen-presenting cells, uh, CD4, or T helpers, we call it T helper or CD4, uh, comes in and initiate uh, 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 a presenting cell, an interlocking mechanism. Then they produce interleukin one, interleukin two, which uh, awaken the entire immune system. So this is how we activate, you know, the, we also activate B cells. B cells start producing popping up uh, antibodies. So, under T, we have uh, T helper cells, sometimes we call it T4, and we have uh, C cytotoxic, sometimes we call it uh, T8 or CD8. Okay. Uh, response to a later exposure in the same in to the same infectious agent. You know, this is known, we took this long time ago. You know, 10 graders, 9 graders know the answer to this question. If you are infected with a virus or, you know, for the first time, your antibody, you know, load will be low, maybe 10 to the power of 1, 10 to the power of 2. Let's assume that you got infected with the same virus uh, three months later or four months. Now, because you have memory for this particular pathogen, your antibodies will probably be 10 to the power of 6, 10 to, 10 to the power of 7, which means the second response will be much, much faster and much, much higher in antibodies than the first response. Distinguish self from non-self. What's self from non-self? It's MHC. MHC, major histocompatibility complex. I know it's complicated. What does it mean? It means that uh, your cells have... Uh, uh, barcode. This barcode on your cells is different than the barcode on your brother's uh, cells. It's different than the barcode on your father's cells. Each one of us has uh, his or her own uh, barcode on our cells. Where is it located? 
It's on each and every cell. Where exactly? On a cell membrane. How? The glycoprotein on our cell membrane, they form a complex or a pattern, you know, like just like the barcode uh, that we see when you go buy something from the market, you know, and they scan this barcode. So we have specific barcode. How do we know this? You know, imagine if you get an organ transplant, kidney transplant or heart transplant, you know, what's the first thing the recipient is going to do? Rejection, rejection. How does the, the recipient recognize that this kidney came from somewhere else? Because this kidney has MHC, different than the MHC of its own body cells. Now, MHCs are two types, MHC1 and MHC2. MHC1, which is a um, major histocompatibility complex recognized by T cytotoxic, T cytotoxic, which has the antigen CD8. But MHC2 is uh, antigens recognized by the T helper cells or uh, CD4. Thank you.